He's the U.S. brand ambassador for Jack Daniels. He's the founder of Dirty Sue, and he once was nearly tricked into purchasing a counterfeit Smokey and the Bandit car. This is Rock on the Rocks with E.T. Thanks for tuning in. We have a, a great show tonight. We have Matt Sorum here. I'm super excited to to talk to Matt. And uh, before we bring him out, I want to introduce you to the producer of tonight's show, Chris Denman, also the host of his own podcast, Drinks with the Band, cool guy and a very good friend of mine. Come on out, Chris. I'm here and I'm ready to party, cool guy and <laughs> podcast host. That's uh, Think about that. Ten years ago, I don't know if those two words would go together, but hey, it's the time we're living in and I appreciate it, man. Great to be here. Hey, and it's all true, so it all works. <laughs> it does. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, cool guy. Yes, sure, I'm great. But your guest tonight is a drummer for Guns N' Roses. <laughs> like, how does this? Right. How does this happen? All right, time out, time out. If you don't think I'm freaked out enough that I'm going to talk to Matt Sorum in a minute or two, you don't have to uh, make it worse for me. But yeah, <laughs> man, I, I I don't know. Look, from a kid who grew up uh, never playing any instruments, just loving music from, from, you know, my parents with the Beatles and all that came after that and Sinatra and then just, you know, continuing loving music my whole life to have a show where Matt Sorum is going to be a guest on. I, you know, look, it's, it's, I'm not sure what's going on. It's incredible, but I, I do know you a little bit now. We've become good friends and I see the potential with this. I know the stories that you have, but connecting with people um, over cocktails has been something that you've kind of hung your hat on. Yeah, look, it's, it's, I, I think that's a unique world. I mean, I bartended for, over two decades and the last gig I had um arguably the best gig I had that's where I met Matt you know he was a regular there and look he could have come in I'm the drummer for Guns N' Roses sat in the corner booth and talked to no one and no one would have judged him for that right because who needs to be bothered when you're out having date night or out with your friends um but he was just cool man he he really took the time to get to know people that work there and be you know, he was just a genuine, good human, and he was one of our favorite regulars. And trust me, there's a lot of regulars that came in. We we're like, oh my god, I'm on break. You know, I'm out of here. <laughs> but when when right. Matt came in, it was just like, you know, look, he was beloved at that bar. So I'm I'm really excited to have him on the show. I'm gonna brag on you a little bit here. I think people <laughs> people are gonna be excited to get to know you better and understand why people like Matt don't hesitate to come on and, and share a side that maybe we haven't seen somewhere else. Yeah, I, look, I don't think Matt knows you that well to make a good decision about whether he should be on the show or not. Um, <laughs> but I, look, you know, to be honest, the, the you know, I, I had never spoke to Matt for a thousand hours. You know, we've met a few times at the bar and, and he's a good guy, but I think you know, he's done this his whole life. I mean, he's been a band since he was a kid. And I think it's, it's really Matt is, is a genuine human being that knows the position he's in and knows that people really want to hear stories about how he got there and what it was like while there and where he's going from, from there. And so I, I think someone like Matt knows it's part of the gig to, to do stuff like this. I'm just happy that he said yes to this one. Well, absolutely. But that's what, what happens is not everybody has that insight. And for you to be able to tap into that in a conversational show, um, congratulations, man. I think people are going to really enjoy this. No, look, I, I, I appreciate it. What, you know, look, having come from the bar world, you know, there's a connection that happens at a bar between bartender and customer, customer and customer and customer and stranger, you know, like, so there's a, an intimacy and a, um, a uniqueness to having a conversation in a bar that you don't really see in, in any other line of work. And I'm hoping to kind of bring a little bit of that, that bar, um, you know, that vibe to, That's to people so they can hear that from someone they might really dig or maybe discover someone they never knew about and, and be like, wow, that was cool. They really, you know, told me some really cool stuff. 
No, it's a way to do it. We're not all going to get that opportunity to sit down with Matt in a bar in Los Angeles. Maybe if you're in a city like St. Louis, like me, you catch somebody who played third base for the Cardinals 10 years ago. I don't know that uh, we're all getting the Guns N' Roses treatment. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited for the drink later. It's going to be a good time. All right. Welcome to Rock on the Rocks, Mr. Calvo. How are you? Uh, well, happy to be here, my friend. That's so I I have a hard time introducing you without telling you uh, or telling people how I was introduced to you well, in the beginning. It's too fun not to talk about. Uh, you would be crazy not to, right? Yeah. So, mm. Carlos... Um, when I first started at my last bar job, I would end up being there for 15 years. And I think the week I started, Carlos showed up to the bar and ordered a Jack on the rocks. And I'm like, oh, I like this guy. And we started talking and music became another common denominator. And I think for the 15 years I bartended there, you were a regular. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Anyway. Right. And, you know, eventually he met a girl and then they became engaged and they got married and all this good stuff. And the whole 15 years, he would invite me to shows. He was a musician or is not was, but, you know, and hey, I'm doing this gig Saturday night. Like, I got to work. And that went on for 15 years. And then he's I'm a better friend than you are. Right. right. You came to see me at my work. I never came to see you at your work. Hey. Um, I do feel like as, as the story evolves, you'll see, I've made up for it, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't say so yourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, the, uh, so after I left that gig, we lived in the same neighborhood. So we got together a couple of times and I was working on this project and we needed a house band right. and the week we were looking for the, like what band we we're going to bring on you sent me another invite to another show i'm like i wonder what kind of music this guy plays i've been hearing about for 15 years 16 years it does. and yeah so i used the, the google and cyber stalk to i'm like oh shit, he plays really good music and then you came in and you ended up being the house band at that project for almost three years that's right in a row yeah which is awesome and then we put together something that we took on the road we did and then along the way you gave me another gift the gift of music and you've been my guitar teacher for the past year or so yeah I so have. now that i'm looking back on it maybe it's still out of balance <laughs> i'm telling you i'm a better friend i'm i'm pretty sure anyone watching would agree yeah, I, uh, I think I miscalculated when I made that statement uh, three minutes ago. Um, kid just I love you. Yeah, I still owe you. I owe you. Um, but anyway, so flash forward, whatever it's been now, 18 years. Um, and Carlos not only is a fantastic musician and good friend and better friend than I am to him, but <laughs> turns out um, he... Uh, He's kind of like a home cook, which means he's got a very good palate. So he's going to also make a drink at some point for us um, because he just has skills in, in all these different arenas. Yeah. These so you are not, can, music and, and cocktails are not completely unrelated, right? They're not, it's not, uh, it's not so strange, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. I think they kind of go together. Um, right. The... Now you've been playing music your basically your whole life, right? You've never had like another gig. It's always been music. Yes, I've I've been a full time working musician now for uh, well, let's just say for over thirty years, about 33, 34 years. It's crazy. Um, I mean, it shows because I had two other guitar teachers that I never learned a chord from, and then day one you had me strumming a Stone song, so. That's true. You have my vote uh, for awesome music guy. Now, Take it. what was your first like inspiration? Like, what was the first music you heard? Like, holy shit, that's I want that. Beatles. Yeah. Beatles in, in real time, and this is what you know. I am. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm even slightly older than you are. Um, so, oh. uh, and this was <laughs> actually when the Beatles were still a band. I was a little kid. 
I was like three and a half years old and I heard uh, a couple of Beatles songs there. And, um, and I happened to be in Spain at the time. I was, my mom was going to helping, taking care of an ill aunt of my father's. And so we were in Spain for a year. She, she took me with her obviously. And, and, uh, and an uncle came to visit and he had some guitar skills and I just hounded him and I got, you have to show me how to play this on guitar. And, uh, and I have recordings of myself as a around a three and a half, four year old playing, uh, and I love her, riff, uh, and as well as a little bit of Let It Be. Crazy, right? right. Yeah. So time out. Would you would you say it's fair to say that if you brought that recording to our next lesson, that you were better at four than I am right now? No. <sighs> Thank God. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> I only say that because we're we're on kind of public. So right. <laughs> privately, I want to have a different answer. No, 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 man. Your 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 skills uh your skills are quite quite good, and uh, the rate of improvement is uh, equal to the passion you have for music and things related. So uh, I'm just so happy. I'm just happy that I was better than a four year old Carlos at, at yeah. Yeah, you keep, that would have really keep, been kick my butt. Yeah. Either I would have just had to convince myself that you are the greatest, most natural talent that ever lived, yeah. or I'm just which you don't know off. that I'm not, you know. But that's but, true. Uh, that's true. But um, yeah. so yeah, the Beatles. Um, yeah. What's fun is at the beginning of COVID, we had you on the roof at the bar that we met at, um, right. playing some Beatles, which was really fun. That, that was really fun. That was great. I mean, you know, how, how to lock me in for a gig. Just ask me to come play some Beatles. Yeah, that and was fun. Stones, Zeppelin, Hendrix, you know, accordingly, that was like the evolution, you know? Or uh, the, Zeppelin, Hendrix, Stones. Let's put it in that order. Right. Um, now, in modern day times, is there anyone that, that you look to now? I know because I, I kind of live a lot in... in those days of music is there anything currently or in the past even five or ten years that even like wow it's badass shit now you mean like from a musician standpoint like really amazing instrumentalists or just band songwriters like great i think there's a ton of great new me i'm, I'm a, i think I, ha I have a very uh, unpopular opinion for people my age but i think there's a ton of awesome Great new music and even guitar players like Gary Clark Jr. You know, is just really fun. I love when he does covers, right. the way he interprets, uh, like his come together a cover for some, some yeah. bad film that he did, but that was, was heavy. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've heard that song covered before, but, uh, but his take on it was bluesy, heavy, nag gritty, you know, uh, massive. There, there's also for the guitar nerds, there's a couple of kind of, uh, I have a student that calls them like stunt players, like Joe Bonamassa and, right. and, and Tommy Manuel and people like that. They're phenomenal players and with, you know, nearly boundless skill who could seem to just do anything. Um, for me, when you separate the great musicianship from the great like song, I, I, even as a full on guitar nerd, I start to lose interest. So right, for, I got so you. For me, there's a lot of really great, uh, like in the indie world, guys like, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name? The guy James, uh, <laughs> a warm <laughs> drug, spins like this. Uh, uh, put me on the spot, man. Th this is what happens in my advanced age of when the bar is open this early. Right. No, it, but, it, uh, it happens. But no, you've, you've, you've given it a bunch of good ones. The, um, did I before we get to the drink? Because I really want. To, um, what's that? Jim Jim James. This is oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There James. you go. Took some. Took a second. Um, yeah. The uh, do I remember this correctly? When you decided guitar was going to be your thing, that your dad took you to a guitar guy in Spain to get your first guitar. Yeah, we bought well because you know my dad was from Spain, and so if uh, once he saw that I was. Uh, serious about guitar he's like there's only one kind of guitar you're gonna play that's spanish you know you're gonna play a spanish guitar and he he found me this incredible teacher in new york city 
And when it was apparent that it, there was no way I was going to be backing out of this, quitting, he, you know, it was time to have a respectable uh, Spanish classical guitar. And as, you know, especially then, there's really only one place you can get them. And that's in Spain, you know. Now you can you find them here. Uh, right. You know, they're imported with great frequency and great quality. But, uh, yeah, but it was great going to, going to Madrid and, and picking out a, a guitar was pretty pretty memorable uh, dad experience, you know, dad bonding experience. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. That's a good one. Yeah, um, cool. yeah I think I, the I think you've shown me that guitar too, which is gorgeous. Um, the uh, what also I know is gorgeous because I've seen this cocktail before. Um, this yeah. little Boulevardier you make. Um, I would right. love to get that going. Yeah, let, let's we can anytime. The bull, I love this cocktail. Uh, the first time I had, I it was love at first sight. The first time I, I attempted to make one, I made one uh, for my wife and myself, and then have no memory directly after that, other than waking up, <laughs> both of us fully clothed, at around <laughs> four in the morning on the couch, not knowing what the heck happened. You know, like, wow, that's some drink. You know, <laughs> that was one drink. Uh, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, the immune system was down that day or something. But uh, but it was a memorable first experience. Uh, I wasn't scared to try it again, though, because that's right. the kind of guy I am, as you know. I see that. I see that. Fearless. What do you think? Should we mix one? I yeah, call this one. one. This is my little riff. It's a little tiny riff on, on the Boulevardier, which for people, most of your audience probably knows, it's essentially a, Negr a Negroni with the spirit swapped uh, from gin to uh, whiskey. And uh, I, I've actually experimented with uh, many whiskeys. And I think because of the other ingredients, I think a bolder whiskey really is the best choice. So something like a Gentleman Jack might be a little too mild and smooth or a Woodford Reserve or something like that. But uh, it turns out Jack number seven to me just does it for the drink. Cool. Nice. So, what do you think? I have a mixing it. glass here. Put some ice in it. Should we just go ahead? Yes, yeah, make it. I'm going to do uh, an ounce and a half of Jack Daniels and an ounce of Campari. And then I take the third element and kind of divide it. I do three quarter ounce of sweet vermouth and one quarter ounce of Amaro. So this this riff I, I live in a this is called the Miracle Mile Wilshire Boulevardier, that's right. Nice. See what I did there? I like get a little stir. Pretty good technique for uh. uh... For example, well you messed the hands, man. Right. I do practice. It's no different <laughs> than guitar. Play. All right. Let's see, you got some ice already. In a rocks glass, you got to have the big ice to impress your friends. We're going to have a little bit of an orange uh, garnish, if you like. A little twist like there, I like it. Southern California, I like to squeeze some of those essential oils and uh, do a, a sensual trip around the rim. Sorry, what is the rating of this podcast? May I ask? I should have asked uh, ahead of time. Uh, Twenty one and over. Twenty one and over. So this is the uh, this is the Wilshire Boulevardier, the Miracle Mile. Love it. Cheers. Cheers. To you. Yeah, man. Mm. I'm telling you, you know those Campari, Sweet Vermouth. Those are pretty big flavors, and I I, I have to uh, emphasize that a bold whiskey really uh, complements it. Uh, best right, right. It, uh they play well with each other not no they, one's they, the star they all kind of no one's the star yeah the drink is a little bit about balance isn't it as so many things are that i get wrong in life uh so yeah no i think that's really astute of you because it, it it not every drink you just sub this for that and it's the same drink you know certain yeah. like you brought up a gentleman jack so that works really well in certain cocktails but sure. it might get overshadowed in a drink like that. And it's exactly smart right. to, that's it's also fun to, 
try it out. You know, maybe you, uh, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. I have, I have, you know, the failures are not that terrible as it turns out when you're <laughs> experimenting with something. It, this is also probably the maximum number of uh, ingredients in a cocktail for me personally. You know, I like it okay. like pretty straightforward Manhattan's right. old fashions and the gronies. Uh, Martinez is a classic for me. Nice. Love the Martinez. And, but, uh, but here it is. Look at that. That sounds like it's a so common crazy. theme of spirit forward is your is your style. Spirit, yes. Uh, my you know, most preferred and cocktail that I imbibe most frequently is a spirit in a glass with ice. Nice. Okay. I, uh, the ice being the mixer, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I usually agree with that, although since COVID I've realized how bad my freezer ice is, so I've been just going neat. Um, right. The secret is to go through it quickly. Yes, and yeah. that's true. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. You don't have to worry about. Arm, you know, especially when you're used to working at uh, really nice quality. Uh, yeah. Bar. No, we. I have a this weird ice maker that it's not just like a big cube maker. It's it's a whole contraption, and it works really well. But it takes up like half the freezer, which my wife is not willing to offer me on the reg. So these, these are the negotiations of marriage. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, the, uh, yeah, it's not the hill I'm going to die on. So I'll just go Jack Neat and no. Jack you know, back off. <laughs> Lovely. So uh, yeah, look at us having a Jack together in the afternoon, beautiful afternoon. So I like it. I, I, I do miss, I mean, we've been doing virtual for a year now and I do miss oh. my Carlos Calvo time, but uh, I look forward forward to when it when it uh when we can do it again um but i do appreciate you coming on the show i always love telling the story of how <laughs> you're a better friend to me than i am to you and uh <laughs> yeah, my favorite story too you know? yeah it's uh no. it's good but AT, you're yes amazing. brother i love this i love the rocks on the rocks rock on the rocks it's a great great uh podcast it's fun you have, i mean you know, I think you're actually being very kind having me on compared to some of the guests. You've had some pretty, uh, pretty no, impressive. Man, come on. It's, it's, I couldn't love me some Carlos Calvo more. So I'm yeah. psyched that you're on the show. Mm-hmm. And hope... What's that? I don't know if Matt Sorum's spoon mixing technique is quite up to. It, it might not be, but, um, and I can ask him that, but the, the, I'm, I'm actually hoping that having you on balances the scale a little bit. It, ha- it certainly has. It, cer- it nice. certainly has. It's been uh, quite quite the privilege, the pandemic privilege. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, cheers to you, and hopefully I'll see you soon in real life. Sooner than later, man. And, uh, you know, keep practicing. I will. I will. Thank you. I need to hear that every once in a while. But... No, right? It's playing, right? I play guitar. I don't yeah. work guitar. I play guitar. Let's play. Guitar. I tell my wife, I'm going to go rock out. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, then she's like, you have a funny, you have a funny way of describing rocking out. Cause I, I hear what comes out of your, your room, <laughs> but I'll get there. I'll get there. It's, it's a work in progress, man. Yeah. It's a process. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm down for the count. I'm down for the count. Every once in a while, she's like, she knows the song I'm playing and that encourages me to keep going. Right. Uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're playing great. And uh, next time we do this, we do this again. Maybe we'll break the guitars out. We'll show everyone how your skills. We should, we should. Uh, yeah. And we won't compare it to you as a four year old for sure. No, <laughs> no, no. Awesome. All right, man. Rock on. I will see you soon. Thank you, man. Thank you for having right. me. Here's ET. Awesome. Best of luck, my friend. Take care. See ya. You know, it's weird. I, I met you at the bar I used to run in Hollywood, and you were, <laughs> you know, you would come in and people were like, oh, you know, Matt Sorum's here. And it could go either way, right? Like you could be what you expect of someone who's a rock star, or you could be a regular guy who happens to be a rock star. And luckily you're a regular guy that happens to be a rock star because everyone loved you. Um, so I'm super psyched to have you on here. And, you know, to me, you're, you're a little bit of an anomaly because you were born and raised in Cali and most people you meet in Cali, especially LA are from somewhere else, but you're from here, right? 
yeah, that is a rarity, right? In LA, when yeah. you find out someone's a native, you're like, wow, really? <laughs> you know, because it's been such a melting pot for so long, especially in the entertainment business. Everyone comes to, to live the dream, you know? And, uh, no, for sure. I, I got to Hollywood in 1979, right out of high school. And I've uh, been there ever since. And I'm, I'm calling you today from, uh, I'm in Palm Springs. I finally got a pad out here. And uh, we could talk about that. It's pretty cool. A lot of cocktail oh, going on out here. You got the appropriate oh, oh. artwork in the background for Palm Springs. Yeah, there's there's our man. I got, uh, where is it? Okay, there he is. Right, there you go, Frank, yeah. of course, you know. Oh, nice. You got that to go with it. And, That's uh, awesome. This is Frank Country. You know, he lived literally about four blocks from my house. I'm in an old neighborhood built in the 60s here. I have a 1960s house. The year I was born, actually. I'm going to be. Oh, wow. My birthday is next month. But uh, anyway, Frank's twin Palms estate is four blocks from me. He built that in the late 40s with a guy named E. Stewart Williams. And the house, you can still rent the house. And Jack Daniels, I believe, did the bar and everything in there because, you know, he was an avid Jack Daniels drinker. But he used to have a flagpole. And right. Tony Curtis and all of his buddies lived kind of in the same neighborhood, which is called Twin Palms. And then where I am here in Vista Las Palmas, Dean Martin lived up the street here. Tammy Davis lived two blocks that way. I mean, they were all right here back in the day. And when, Fla when Frank was home... He would put the flag up. He had a flag and it was basically come over, we're cocktailing. And all of his buddies would say, Hey, Frank's home. And it was like open door. And they would all roll in there and drink and, and have a good time. And and then after that he ended up building the um the big rancho Mirage right. estate. Villa uh, Maggio, is that what it was called? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's what you know, the famous story of, you know, him becoming friends with JFK. John F. Kennedy, right. and then uh, John F. Kennedy's sister lived just around the corner who was married to another Rat Packer, um, the famous uh, Peter Peter Lawford. Yeah, and Peter, brother in law isn't that what they called him? Yeah, one block from me here is Peter Lawford's house where JFK came, and he was married to Frank's sister, Peter Lawford. I mean, uh, John, F. K., John F. Kennedy's sister, so Frank and everyone was over there and Marilyn Monroe came over and that's the famous story about Marilyn meeting uh, JFK. And then about a block up the street in about 1962, Marilyn bought a house up the street too. So I'm in a really cool neighborhood, you know, and I drive, I got a 62 Galaxy convertible and I cruise around. <laughs> I just, I take people on uh, the rock and roll tour, Palm Springs house tour. It's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a that's uh look, I'm a raised on Sinatra on the one half of my my mom and dad and rock and roll on the other. So, you know, hearing that, that you know all that stuff is amazing. Um cuz yeah, Sinatra did raise his flag and he used to call, you know, when it was time to drink, he didn't call it happy hour, he called it post time. So when that flag yeah. was up, it was post time and then you just post up at that bar. Um I can't remember if it was Twin Palms or Villa Maggio, we had that white leather bar. I think it was the the second house. Um, yeah, the it was big like a sunken house, yeah. bar. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Now the, the the house that he built here was built by E. Stewart Williams. It was one of the first mid century house style. It wasn't even mid century yet because it was 1949. But he wanted a big hacienda, and this guy said, "No, no, you want glass. You want it open." And you go in there, man, it's just so cool. My friend runs the property and they rent it out for events and things like that. But right. I went in there. You can just feel That's the vibe, pretty... you know. It's yeah, cool. no, I've I've never been inside of it, but I've seen the the video walk through and it looks pretty I mean, I know they updated some of it, but his his stereo's still there, right? Like his actual Well, he had a rig. He had this, you know, when the people bought the house and we you know, basically the place was kind of dilapidated, they found this old analog rig out back literally kind of behind the garage and it was this old school analog turntable and killer amp like big though and it had two vinyl records on there now well, what does that do and he was able to record a vocal so he would overdub by using vinyl 
and one of them actually cut the vocal to another vinyl record so it would but pre-tape and you know real real right, right. even it was like he was like what and uh so that's in the house now they've refitted it and it it's in there and it's you know original splendor and everything and it runs the, the house system and but so old school it's just massive you know thing and uh that's pretty amazing the uh now the 60s you know you you uh kindly reference your birthday coming up and you know this house and 60s house that's also is that true that's when you discovered drums when you were a little like a little little kid well yeah you know well yeah i mean we used to have a thing that the family did after dinner which was the ed sullivan show and Ed Sullivan was the, sort of the family hour variety show. And, you know, here I was five years old. The Beatles played Ed Sullivan three times. And, uh, you know, I was a little too young the first time they came because that would have been like just about four years old. So, but we watched it, but, you know, I was too young. And the, but the, but the third time caught my attention. And, um, I was just coming up on five and, and I remember watching the Beatles and uh, the song was, I feel fine. I'll never forget it. Cause I pointed to the TV and I said something to my mom, like, I want, I, I want to do that. You know, it was just this thing, you know, light bulb went off and, and Ringo, you know, was the, just this guy, he was like, almost like a cartoon character back there. And it, for a kid, it was like, you know, they were all cartoon characters in a way. Right. You know, with the haircuts and the uniform, and so they gravitated towards everyone. It was everybody liked the Beatles, you know, and and that was it for me, man. And I just said to my mom, and after that, I got a little drum set for Christmas. You know, not an expensive one, like a cheap one from Sears or something, you know. But right, right. I started banging on that thing. My two older brothers hated it. They basically, you know, would kind of noogie me and whatever. <laughs> But I was determined, you know, I was determined. And once I got good, then my brothers were asking me, you know, right. to help care. Yeah. <laughs> my They're middle brother, gigs. Me my, yeah, my middle brother actually bought me my first real drum set because he noticed I started getting pretty good and I had a little band. Even in elementary school, I had a band called Liquid Earth. We were like a, we do like everything from Crosby, Sills, Nash & Young to, you know, I had a pretty good guitar player, so we played Hendrix and The Cream, you know, in the 60s. So That's elementary when, school? Someone could play that? Yeah, I had a buddy in elementary school. I ended up being a ripping guitar player named Jeff Harris. He was like the only African-American kid in the school. And, of course, he, he looked like Hendrix. He had a killer afro. He was like, you know, and he could play, man. And we, uh, we had a three-piece band that we called Prophecy. And that and around junior high school, we started getting really good. And we'd play like all the parties because people had backyard parties with kegs, you know, kegs of right. beer. You'd hear someone had a keg and everyone was like, well, like, they got a keg, you know, <laughs> we'd all go there. And, and we started making our way up to Hollywood when I was pretty young. And I'd sneak up to Hollywood when I was like 14 years old. My, I wrote about Eddie Van Halen the other day on a blog because... I used to play Gazzari's when I was 14, 1974. And there was a band there called Mammoth. It was the early version of Van Halen. That was before they got David Lee Roth and before they got Michael Anthony. And then uh, around 75 or 76, Michael and David joined. And I remember that happening. I remember them being Mammoth with David Lee Roth. And then they found out some other band had that name, you know, and they were like, <laughs> right. And they had to change their name. So they changed their name to Van Halen. And then they got signed just down the street on the strip at the whiskey a go-go and the rest is history. But I was reminiscing about how I used to sneak into the back door of that club because I was, they had an all ages night, which was the night we played. So I believe that I was okay to get in there at that particular time, but there was other clubs that I snuck into. And right. I was a kid. I mean, I was a, you know, I was a baby, but I was up there banging on drums. So 
I was up in Hollywood pretty early. And the Hollywood energy just sucked me in, especially in those days. I, it was just such a vibe. It was so cool, you know? What, what, I mean, you know, there was something special about that era and in that town, like music. Now we got Nashville, we got Austin, you had Seattle for a while, you know, you have Chicago at some point, but that era, Hollywood was it. That was the epicenter. Like what, what was it like for someone that will never experience that as a kid going there, what was it like? Like what, what did that feel like walking out Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard back in the day? It was, it was like a dream escape. It was, uh, so in those days, you know, obviously we had no internet. All we had was magazines, you know, we had circus magazine, <laughs> right. And it was like this, the mystique of rock and rolls made you, made you think kind of what might be happening. You didn't really know there wasn't this information of, you know, what these bands were doing, you just could imagine what they might be doing. You know, you would think about Led Zeppelin in a castle. He's like, oh, they're in a castle, you know? And so when I came to Hollywood, you know, when I was a kid, it was all there. It was like this melting pot of all these crazy, interesting looking people. And, you know, there was a club down on, on uh, Santa Monica called the Starwood. And that was another club in the mid seventies that I frequented. And there was, there was an interesting thing happening there. You know, it was the first time I saw Judas Priest and Devo was playing there. And, you know, all these bands before they really blew up, well, Priest was already kind of big, but they were getting big. Uh, uh, I remember the first time I met Nikki Six. you know, here was this guy with this massive hair and he had, you know, high heels and, and these guys looked like the New York Dolls and everyone dressed crazy. And it was just, it was like a, it was like Disneyland for rock and roll, man. It was. Right. You know, there was no, you know, nobody doing this whole social media thing. So you were just in this bubble of mystique and weirdness and coolness and, you know, walking the hallways of the Starwood or, you know, I remember uh, doing that and seeing all these characters and, and uh, it was like a Fellini movie, but rock and roll, you know, it was. Makes sense. Like a smorgasbord of. I don't know, just energy and you know, everyone was, what was there that for first. Me. Yeah. The, what was that first show? Like, I, you know, I remember as a kid, like seeing certain bands and that, that one that's almost like life changing where you see a band for the, like live for the first time that just kind of rocks your world. And you're like, I can't even believe that's happening. Do you remember what that was for you? Well, the first big concert I went to, I actually went to see a band, the James gang, but the band that was headlining was kiss. Okay. And me and my buddy, me and my buddy, he had a, he had a license, and I was only fifteen. And this was the moment that I thought I could make it as a drummer because I already had a band. I was playing pretty good. And a lot of people say I was better drummer then than I am now, but <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> I was less, I don't know, just a kid. You know, I was just going for it. And I went to see Kiss. We went to Long Beach Arena, and I remember we didn't have tickets. We were trying to find scout tickets. And we had uh, twelve dollars between us, and uh, the tickets ended up not being. We couldn't find a scalp ticket, so I said, "Hey, let's let's go up to the will call window." So we walked up to the will call window, and the lady said, "You're in luck. I got two fifth row seats center for five fifty each. Oh, five dollars. Yeah." I go, "Oh my God, we have twelve dollars. <laughs> we have eleven dollars." And I remember we. We ran down to the front. James Gang came on with Joe Walsh, and they were just killer. And I loved that band. And, and then Kiss came out, you know. And I, I can't say I was a huge Kiss fan. I was more into like, I was into all kinds of stuff. I was into Sabbath, Deep Deep Purple, some progressive music. I was into gen early Genesis. Kiss wasn't sort of like it was sort of like. Every guy, you know, everybody liked Kiss. Everybody liked Zeppelin. I can't say I was a huge Zeppelin fan till later because I liked to be a little bit weirder or different or something. <laughs> I don't know. Right. So, but when Kiss came on, I remember that stuff was so simple. And Peter Chris drum solo, he came into the drum solo. And I looked at my buddy and I went, I'm as good as that guy. He goes, no, I'm better. And I went, all right. It kind of was like 
the moment when I thought, if he can do it, I can do it. And that was pretty much it. And, you know, obviously Kiss in those days, that was the Dress to Kill tour. And it was, it was awesome. I mean, I remember watching the show going, oh my God. I mean, it's like, and there it was, Fifth Row. So that was pretty the pinnacle moment for me that that and uh, my teacher, I had a band teacher in high school and I used to play in the, 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 the jazz band and I played in the marching band. And he, he came up to me in my junior year of high school and he said, I think you got what it takes to be a professional musician. And I didn't really have the backing of my family. They weren't too excited about me running off to Hollywood, you know, right, <laughs> trying right. to make it a musician or whatever. Cause it seemed like a pipe dream to them, you know? And, uh, but when he said that, and then that was really the, the thing that made me go for it, you know? That really says a lot about having a good influence and especially a teacher, right? That's, that's someone of authority that you look up to in some respects. I mean, we all joke about, we don't pay attention to school, but when a teacher says you might have something, that means a lot, even maybe more than parents because your parents will tell you you're good at everything but a teacher doesn't have to tell you you're good at something. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if you know much about my charity, Adopt the Arts, but I, I do I do charity for K through six, and I think it's such an important, like obviously I was a little bit older when, I, when you said that to me, but I have about 600 students at the K through six level that I teach music and art to. And I see those, I see those little gems of creativity. I see these kids, and when they get the idea that they actually got something, like when you discover that this is something I can do, as a human being, I don't care what age you are. I mean, I know people that have been friends of mine that were in high school going into college and they still didn't have a clue what they wanted to do with their life, right? right? And for me, I was lucky because I knew I had, I had to at least go after this destiny. But when I had that, that sort of, you know, guy that I really looked up to, which was this amazing musician, teacher of mine. When he said that, that was really important to me. And I remember that, man, because when I see these little kids that I work with and some kid comes up to me and they show me a song that they wrote or, you know, like you say, I go, man, that's really good. You know, do more of that. And they go like, they look at me like, wow, really? And it changes them forever. Yep. They're like, all of a sudden they've got the, they're starting to build self-esteem and self-esteem, you know, uh, that, Hey man, I'm good at this. And, and, uh, I realized I was, when I realized I had the talent, you know, obviously I, I, I knew I, it was do or die for me because I didn't have any other backup plan at all, <laughs> <laughs> you know? The, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned the teacher and you, you took, you're playing jazz drums, right? And most people really, they'll just look at you and be like rock drummer only, yet you've done a lot of different stuff. And one thing I found shocking, cause I didn't know this, um, and I'm a big fan, that you play with Tori Amos before anyone knew who Tori Amos was. Yeah, I did. Well, you know, you gotta remember, so coming to Hollywood in the late seventies, you know, so here I was a pretty young kid when I finally moved there in 79, stylistically music was changing. You know, punk rock was happening in England. And then we had this West Coast punk rock thing starting to starting to brew. And then New Wave came in the early 80s. So as a musician in Hollywood, if you were going to be in a band or have any kind of sense of like, oh, God, I, you know, because I made one promise to myself. I was never going to have a real job. And if I could make a living playing drums, that's what I was going to do. So. I used to play top 40 music. I played at Disneyland. I used to play the Marriott hotel by the airport. I played the black Angus <laughs> five nights a week, 50 bucks a night. That's what I made and drinks. <laughs> it's a good, that's and, not uh, a bad deal all of a sudden. So I used to play at the Marriott airport hotel five nights a week in the lounge. I had a little band in there and the girl that was at the piano bar in the middle of the lobby was Tori Amos. And this is about 1983 or 84. I walked up to her and I said, who are you? And she was sitting there playing like classical 
and then breaking into like bad company by bad company or and, right. and then sing like contemporary covers but with this like insane piano playing and her voice was like because i was already into like kate bush and peter gabriel and like some esoteric english music and i'm like you, you remind me of kate bush and she said who's that i'm like what so we we hit it off and i said we we're going to start a band together so we started a band and i knew a couple of guys that i thought would be the perfect fit we put a band together and we literally played around Hollywood for two years. We were kind of new wavy. I cut my hair into this like crazy pompadour. Cause <laughs> that's, what was, that's what was happening. Like the knack showed up 2020 plimsolls. Everyone was wearing skinny ties and cut their hair and rock kind of was non-existent. It was no rock bands. It was like new wave. And then it was punk from the, from Orange County, like bands like Fear, and then from San Francisco, the Dead Kennedys and TSOL, and they were all on the strip. There was this punk rock thing, new wave, and there was a, an occasional rocker, but not many. And then we got we got a record deal from Atlantic, and it got signed from this famous guy named Jason Flom and ended up signing Tori as a solo artist. That record bombed. And uh, so before before we had the chance for it to bomb, um, the label basically didn't sign anybody in the band. We all got cut loose and they kept her as a solo artist. And then I was a real discouraging point in my career, but what I learned later on in life is you weren't supposed to be there. They had a right. bigger plan. And the plan was you're going to get back into playing rock and roll. And so around the early 80s, I mean, about, about the mid 80s, about 85, all of a sudden rock and roll came. Sunset Strip, rock and roll. You know, guys started growing their hair out again. It was just kind of like glam rock thing mixed with, you know, the New York Dolls meets, you know. And I remember seeing Priest. You know, and, and then uh, bands at the Starwood. There was a whole group of Hollywood bands that were just like long haired. Of course, Van Halen was a rock band, but remember they came out of the '70s, right? So not the Strip. The Strip had turned and changed. So I kind of had to run real quick and try to grow my hair out. You know, because <laughs> everything in those days was like everything that you did within a band had to be about imagery and even though there was no MTV at that point yet until the, the mid eighties came and then MTV appeared. Right. Right. But no, you took pictures and, and that scene was a scene. It was a specific time and place and everyone had, you know, uh, a part in that. Um, kind of like the seventies, man, everyone kind of fit that whole scene looked the same. And then, you know, 10, 15 years later, it re kind of restarted the, uh, yeah. The, if I say, uh, Pat Boone and Debbie Boone. Does that have any resonance to anything you did? <laughs> I do that fill a lot in a yeah. song called November Rain. <laughs> so I never knew, I, I would never know what that meant. And then I vaguely heard something about that being the name of, of a drum technique. And I was like, what? Wait, I got to ask Matt that. Well, yeah, because it's a funny story because me and Axel, we were listening, we were in the studio, so we were making these albums, Huge Illusion 1 and 2. And we were on La Brea Boulevard, the famous old Charlie Chaplin Studios, which became A&M Records, which was Herb Albert from the Tijuana Brass and Jerry Ma created A&M. And that particular studio lot where we recorded Huge Illusion 1 and 2 was A&M Studio, which is now called Henson, right there on La Brea. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that originally was Charlie Chaplin's studio. Anyway, we're in there, Studio A, big studio, the same place they cut We Are the World with Michael Jackson, a bunch of great records in there. And Axel says, let's go to Greenblatt's Deli and get some caviar. I go, what? Because now he was a rich rock star and he could afford to buy caviar. I'm like, I never had caviar. He says, let's get some really nice vodka 
and we're going to sit and we're going to eat cabin and we're going to listen to Elton John. I said, what? Elton John? So we put on these records uh, with this great drummer, Nigel Olson, which was Elton John's drummer. And we were listening to this song called Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And it had these big epic tom fills. Do 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 boom boom. Don't let sun go down on me. Do 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 do. And Axel says, "You know that song, November Rain, that we've been working on. I want you to do that." And I go, "Okay." He goes, "But come up with a fill that you do like every time." So I do that fill, Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. 21 times in that song. <laughs> <laughs> now, where, where did that even come from, though? Because it seems so random as a thing for your world, from their world. Elton John? No, the Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, like that being a reference to something it's you'd be doing. Remember, Joe, it's like a bucket of fish, bucket of fish, tossing salad, tossing salad, you know? Gotcha, gotcha. Like right. You're looking at Mitchell from the Hendrix. You go, he's tossing salad. You know, it's like bucket of fish, bucket of fish. Wubba da wubba da. Pat Boone, Debbie <laughs> right. Boone. So it's oh, Pat gosh, you got Boone, you. Debbie Boone. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, right? And I've gotten razzed about it from other drummers. They're like, man, <laughs> could you come up with any other drum fill? I go, no. Why? Because for me, it was like, was like a musical statement. And I actually thread it through a couple of the other songs that are part of what Axel like to call the trilogy. So I, I tinkle, I tinkle it in, 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 in don't cry. And it's, it's in it's the song called a strange too, because those songs were connected and Axel wanted to have like this reference point. I'm like, well, a lot of people don't think of the drums as a musical instrument. I'm like, well, I can make it musical phrase that people will remember as sort of a statement. You know, like the intro to You Could Be Mine. You know, I set that up in a way that says this, you know. And we, right, right. you know, it's not like we thought about that kind of stuff. We didn't, like, we didn't have these, like, deep conversations about we're going to, hey, we're going to do this. We would challenge each other to take an intro. Who could come up with the best intro? And, you know, Slash had a killer riff. And, you know. It's right. like, you got that one. You know, that was before, my, <laughs> before I joined. But obviously, that bitching or right. sweet, child, sweet Child of Mine, the story behind that is Slash was joking around. He was laying on the floor, and I think he'd had a couple too many toddies. And he was like, he was he was looking at his guitar, and I think he was like, his eyeballs were like, <laughs> he was just being weird. And Axel walked by, and he said, what is that? And, I, and Slash went, huh? And that became the most epic, probably guitar intro, maybe one of all time. And it was kind of Slash joking around, but those guys were smart enough to know this is really impactful. Like you could be mine, Phil, at the beginning of that happened by accident. I actually did it in the third take. I didn't. The song used to just start do, 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 da, do, 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 da, do, and the third take, I just went, do, da, do, 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 da. I went into that thing and the band all went, huh? <laughs> and in those, days, in those days, we cut everything live. So there was no pro tools. Everything was tape. There was no good like, hey, use that, put it on take one or now. Nah. What you hear is what you get. I mean, those albums, you know, all those those earlier records were done live on tape. We usually do one take from the beginning to the end. And we never really overanalyzed things. We didn't like, you know, I, listening back to the records, were there things I would have done differently? Well, yeah, but it was, it was a different time. It was the vibe we were in at the time. It was, it was great. Right. That's, that's awesome. Now, so, Look, man, you're in the cult, you're in Guns N' Roses, you've, you've done it all, you're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I've met you, and you don't seem like a guy that, that gets rattled too easy. However, you told me a story years ago at the bar that 
you were I, Belgium maybe you were playing with uh, I guess it was mm-hmm. probably 2008 and the band that was below you guys on the bill the singer was a famous singer son and you were warming up for your show you're doing a sound check and then you look over into the the wings and you kind of did a double take do you remember that Robert Plant yeah yeah, well, there's a. I had a couple. Of, I had a couple of situations with Robert Plant, but one of them was that when he walked in, when I was in the cult, and uh, there he was, and he's standing there. You know, I had that happen with me with him and Jimmy Page. While you're playing. He, yeah, well, when you look over, so you're in front of a big audience, you know, and you're like, it's not like it's another day at the office, but you know, you got this great audience, and you do what you do, and. But the thing that freaks you out is when these guys, these big name guys show up, you know, it's like, holy shit, that's Robert Plant, you know, and, and he's standing there watching you from the side of the stage. And it's a little like nerve wracking, you know, that happened when he came, when he walked in the cult show, he came on stage and, and he was like basically helping his son set up, who was a really great singer. And. Our agent at the time was good friends with Robert, and he asked if we'd have Robert Plant's kid open. We're like, yeah, cool. And then uh, years later, I was in this area of uh, England called Wolverhampton, which is up in the okay. black, in the black country of England. Which you know, there's a song, "Black Country Woman." Yeah. And I'm on the tour bus. And I'm getting up. I'm kind of groggy. We've driven all night from some other town. And I look out the window, and there's Robert playing again. But this time he's carrying drums. And I look, and I go, I think Duff is in the bus or something. I go, Duff, man, is that Robert Plant? <laughs> he's like, and he's carrying drums like a roadie, like a drum tech. They don't like to be called roadies anymore, by the way. They like to be called tech. <laughs> so, noted, noted. Uh, I was like, yeah, man, I think his son's opening tonight. Now he's got another son who's a drummer. And there we are. Hey, it's Robert Plant calls and said he wants to get his kid to open. We're like, okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I, go in, I go into the gig, and here we are in the dressing room. And the door comes open, and there's, there's Robert Plant. Comes rolling in. And uh, I got my wife with me, Ace, and of course he points himself down next to my wife. Hello, love. You know, I'm like, oh <laughs> right. man, he still got it. And <laughs> he starts talking about the black country because you guys are in the black country, and we're like, wow, really? I go, hold on, you mean black country woman? He's like, yeah, that's what, she, that's what it's about, the black country women. If you if you get on their bad side, you know, they like to spike you in the head with the shoe. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> he was great. Was, we got obviously we had to get a photograph, but um, that was that was really cool. And then it's pretty amazing. Yeah. The, we uh, had now, do you run, know, run, go ahead? You know, go ahead, man. Yeah, we had those kind of run-ins, and I think I think maybe on that same tour, I remember we were we were playing this place called the Apollo Theater, and. Uh, in London, we had like, we did like seven sold out nights there. We wanted to do this theater. And one night um, I'm standing outside the, we had two tour buses in the back, like trailers or tour buses or something, I can't remember. But uh, all these cool people were coming, like, you know, really interesting people showing up, London people and celebrities and stuff. But I look and I see, Jimmy Page and Brian May walking towards me from Queen, Brian May and Jimmy. Right. And I'm like, oh my God. And I get, and I'd known Brian. I'd met Brian before because we played the Freddie Mercury tribute. And he's a sweet man. He's one of the coolest guys in rock and roll. And I go, Brian. He's like, meet Jimmy. And I'm like, oh, Jimmy Page. Wow. <laughs> and it's kind of like, hey, man, I'm still a fan. You know, I'm going to fanboy out a little bit. I'm going to get, you know, yeah. we all are fans, you know. And, I go, hey, hold on, let me tell Slasher here. So I go and I run into the bus, and Slash is always warming up on his guitar. You know, he's always got his guitar. I go, Slash, 
Jimmy Page and Brian May are here. And he goes, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking was pissed that I told him that because he was like, it freaked him out. He right, didn't right. want to go. But then we went up on stage and he was a whole other level slash that night because he knew those guys were out there. Right. And he was like, that was the one thing for musicians. Like you come up a whole other level. If there's a great drummer standing on stage, like watching me or something, I'm like, fuck, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like as me, it's not a competitive thing. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool, but it, at the same time, it's not that you're being lackadaisical in front of a regular audience, but it is other level of, I don't know, I guess it's just mutual respect and, you know, all that kind it of stuff. probably gives you a little energy too, man. It's like, you know, if, if you're playing basketball, Michael Jordan's watching, you're probably going to want to score more. You know, you're going to you're oh gonna my go God. crazy. Can you imagine the competition between those guys, man? I was like, wow. Right. That's a whole other level and not the crazy stuff. Now, something else random. I, do you, is there a beer named after you? Yes. Or is that fake? Is that real or fake? No, I have it right here. <laughs> Can we see that? Can you see it good? Well, that's not I'll someone have photoshopping. Do you have, have it a in real Br beer? Yeah, I do. That's real beer. That's amazing. It's when is from, it coming out? Uh, it should be out in December. We're working on that right now. Um, it, we're going to start at Bristol Farm. And this is American lager, but it's actually made in Bra Piracaba, Piracaba, Brazil. And it's a Belgium uh, distillery down there that's amazing, made out of an old sugarcane mill. And I went down there to Piracaba, and the guys just, they love rock and roll, and they're like, we want to make you your own beer. And I'm like, okay, what are we going to call it? And I was like, let's call it a Portuguese name for drummer, which is O Batarista. And they go, no, let's call it the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so I got online. There was no drummer beer. And I'm like, the drummer. I thought it was a cool name. Yeah, man, it's awesome. And so That's this is epic. the American And then I got an IPA coming. And I'll have an IPA and the American Lager out. And uh, there's 12 Bristol Farm stores right now. And then next year we'll go wider with it, distribute it everywhere, I hope. Right, right. That's pretty cool. That's, uh, I mean, that I don't think you ever thought there was going to be a beer named after you. Well, you know, you see a lot of rock and roll guys doing doing alcohol. And the one different the difference true, that yeah. I want to kind of say about the drummer, I don't want it to be like, a rock and roll beer per se i i i want to describe it as drums are sort of like the heartbeat of energy and and rhythm in general i think we all have rhythm in our life whether we know it or not we're speaking in rhythm right now we're walking in rhythm everything we do with transcends through our heartbeat we're all rhythmically connected so I, I'm going my whole pitch behind the beer is find your rhythm in life, you know, find, you know, this whole kind of thing where we're going to, we've got a really cool webisodes we're going to start dropping that are all about that. Like if it's a surfer that finds the wave, a guy skateboarder, you know, kite, everybody that finds any kind of movement that really inspires them, it's rhythmically based. And the drummer sets the tone for that, you know, and that's the, that's the idea that we have behind it. And of course, I want to. I'm going to try to do like really cool, like drum. Yeah, you know, there's so many killer like drummers online now. Like, just you go on there and you're like, ah, I can't watch it anymore. You know, right. like kid drummers. I'm like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You know? Some of those like four year old kids that are just doing, yeah. you know, baby boy, baby solos. Boy. Yeah, there's that yeah. Masha girl. She's just blowing up. It's like, but uh. Yeah, we're gonna have fun with it. You know, it's like for me, it's I'm an entrepreneur now. I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but it came to me. It's like, okay, man, I'm in. Let's do it. So, right. well, then what? You know, look, man, you you saw the Beatles on TV, and then you know you you went and saw Kiss and realized you can do this, and you did it, and you went to the 
highest level you're gonna, you know, people can get to in your field. You have a charity. You have a beer coming out. You know, what is there anything left on the table for you that you're like, I still want to do that. I still, you know, that's still something that's on my list that I got to take care of. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I'm really into the entrepreneurial phase of my life now. You know, I, I'm still going to play music. I just finished a record with Billy Gibbons. We have a band called The Big Bad Blues. That's and awesome. I'm sort of at a phase in my life where I just want to do cool stuff. It's not about like, it's not about anything. It's got anything around negativity or drama or any, not to say, I <laughs> not to say that any of my bands were, were drama. Uh, but I want to say that I want to, <laughs> I want to say that I want to work with everybody that I work with or do stuff with. It's got to be no different in the creative process that I used when I was making music. Right. So if it's creative, it's cool. It's like you're a creative guy. We're doing this. We're being creative together. So, if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, let's do a beer, you know, then we got to into the whole process of what's the label going to look like. And it's all fun, you know, and it's like, and if you can make a living, make some money doing it too. Oh, great. Better. And I've got all kinds of stuff cooking in the tech world. I'm, I'm doing like crazy, interesting projects in that world. So I'm looking, always looking for like something interesting. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm Billy Gibbons is coming out here this week. We're talking about putting together a really cool blues festival, which I want to talk to you about later. Sounds um, good. He's, just, he's the king of, I love that guy. He's just, for me, he's the end all. And he's the desert guy, the hot rods, cactus, tacos, you know drinks, cocktails, whatever, you know, it's like, so we're, you know, we're always doing that, uh, chucking and jiving on what we can do together. That's cool. But what Very I cool. find, you know, I find as a drummer, um, you know, being a musician, you know, it's, it's, it's a volatile world being a musician, you know, especially right now, things are so wacky, you know, Right. but I'm like, well, what can we do to, find some solutions for this virtual space we're in. I'm in that world right now. I'm messing around, but you know, um, who knows, you know, it's like, for me, it was like that with music. So it's no different being an entrepreneur when you're a musician, especially a drummer. It's like, what's next. I don't know. What's next. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's cool. And that's you a good know, way to be, you know, you saw all those actors and stuff. that used to come in Jones and stuff. Like there's George Clooney I used to see him every night, right? Yep. When he was on ER, he was in there just, you know, hanging out because it was pretty girls. And next thing we know, he's like one of the biggest movie stars in the world. You know, you just never know. It's like, especially in Hollywood. I always say pe to people, man, you know, just be cool to everybody, man. Cause you know, it's like, not to say that because they get big and you want cool or whatever, but it's like, just be, just be cool, man. You know? Yeah. I, I have a, you know, look, you meet a lot of people when you're in your world and, and, you know, working in Hollywood. And I, I feel like if people are cool before they became George Clooney famous. They're going to be cool then, you know, if they weren't that cool, they're probably going to get less cool when they have this perceived power in the world. So it's yeah. really the person, well, you know, it's, it's, we've seen that happen. Haven't we? We've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the thing I love about Hollywood is, you know, you get your run, don't you? You get your yeah. run, you get your five minutes of fame, and then you, you know, don't be a dick in your five minutes. You know, it's right. like, because then you see me go, hey, how was that? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah, and, you can turn you know, five I, into I, ten or five into nothing real quick if, if you're not. Yeah, I ran into a, a few person. of those characters. I've just been one of the fortunate ones. You know, I, I look at bands like Metallica and, you know, the green days and the bands that stay together, you know? Right. And I'm, I, I'm like, wow. Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. ZZ Top, original band members in that band for 50 years, you know, and that's, that's a rarity in the music business. So I seem to have had like, you know, I've been in all these great bands, you know, and I'm always thinking like, wow, 
is another one going to come like that? I don't know. It's like, you know, I've had a pretty good, pretty good luck with like, you know, to be able to jump from the Colt to guns and then in Velvet Revolver. And then actually I went back to the Colt in the late 90s. Right. Made another record with them, toured again with them. And then, so, I mean, we remain friends, you know, the Colt and, and me. And, um, you know, if they called me tomorrow and say, hey, we want to go on, want you to come out on the road. I would be like, well, let I me mean, think about that for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But for me, for, for me, it's like, uh, that's easy, you know, for right. me to play with Julie Gibbons is no, not only he's a hero of mine, but that gives me this sort of like this other feeling I get. It's like when I went and joined Motorhead for that short period of time. I, I don't know if you know that, but. I went and played Bre- I mean, vaguely, yeah, right. You know, that was like, as a musician, it's like, okay, uh, that's like really big honor. <laughs> and same thing when I when I joined with Alice Cooper and you know did the Hollywood Vampires for a short stint. You know, that was, I guess it was a super group throwing together kind of thing for like notoriety's sake, but still. I'm up there with Alice and Joe Perry, and I'm like, this is cool. Because these yes. guys, those guys came before me. Those are guys, me and my buddy went to see Alice Cooper in the mid-70s, and we saved up for, in those days, what we call the four-finger lid of weed. You could, buy for, <laughs> <laughs> you could buy for like 15 bucks because the stuff wasn't very strong. It's not like the pot they got these days. Yeah, stuff's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, the shit they got these days is like, what? But you'd smoke like 20 joints, you know, like no problem. And you just kind of have a headache and be stoned, you know? Right. <laughs> so I remember we went to see Welcome to My Nightmare Tour in the, in the 70s. Like, I think it was probably around 76 or 77. And here I was a kid and watching Alice Cooper. Like, never in my wildest dreams that I think I'd ever be on stage with a guy playing in a band with him. You know what I mean? Right. And so I'm doing that. And then Joe Perry, same thing. I saw Aerosmith at the Anaheim Stadium in 76, I think. You know, and then here I am with Joe. And now we're, you know, we text each other. He's like, he's like a friend. It's weird. And, and I still think of it that way. I think like, man, I look at it. I actually look at all of it with a lot of gratitude. I'm like, I'm living the dream of like any kid that wanted to be a rock and roll band. Here I am, you know, and then the weirdest one of all of them is along the line, along the way, I met Ringo. Right. And and I was like, what? Like, this is just getting weird. That's crazy. the guy called me on my birthday, he called me, he did a video for me online. I'm like, he invites me to his birthday. I'm like, wait a minute. So I'm like must, super yeah. grateful. Look, super man, gratitude. you just, in five years old, you're watching the Ed Sullivan show and that guy inspired you and now he leaves you birthday messages. That's gotta freak you out. It's kind of a freaky thing. It's like, is this, yeah. is this like, is like, is this a God thing? I think so. <laughs> you know, right, I yeah. start, well, I became a real, I be, I'm a real believer. I'm a spiritual guy. And I, I believe all those energies that are around you or, or stuff you need to like really be grateful for. But at the same time, you have these experiences and then you turn around and you, you, you do what you can on your part. Like there's some kid in Brazil that thinks I'm Ringo, you know, there's, I don't know. I mean, there's people that go like, look at me and go, whoa, man, you're like the guy, you know, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, feel that way about myself. I'm maybe Ringo wakes up every day and goes, I am a beetle. You know, it's like, I don't know. (laughs) That must be weird. Like you wake up like, yeah, "Yeah, I'm a beetle, you know? Uh, Yeah. But for me, it's sort of like, if somebody comes up to me and says anything about my career, you know, I've always kind of like, I never looked the same. I cut my hair and if they know me. I know they're a real fan and I give right. them the time and I say, thank you. And, you know, so, and it's given me the opportunity to live a pretty cool life. And I got, you know, I got 
cool house and all that stuff. So I look at it like that, you know. That's a good way to look at it, man. Is there any, you know, if, if I, I know you do it through your charity, but if, if anyone watches this, that that's a young kid just being insecure or feeling like they'll never get good, what advice would you give them? If, if you're like 12, 13, 14 year old self could hear someone like, if you didn't have that teacher to give you those kind words, what would you tell someone like that? Well, I think if you got it in you that this is your passion, right? Find your passion, you know, whatever it is. Um, and believe in your, you know, believing in yourself is the hardest thing to do because you're going to look on now. I think it's tougher for, for kids to look online and have all this, comp, all this stuff that they're seeing. It's like this, this juggernaut of, you know, just information and look at all these people and there's, there's all this, you know, and what do I do to navigate that? You know, how do I do that? Like I told you my story, I came to Hollywood in a $40 station wagon, you know, and I drove up here. There was none of this madness of, right. if, you know, information overload. So I would say to any young kid, believe in what you're doing and go after it because in this world, anything is possible. You know, it really is. And believing in yourself is the first step. And then, and I always say, look, you're going to hear a lot of no's before you hear yes. But remember, every time you hear a no, it's not about you. It's not about, don't let that, don't take that as a negative, but just go the another step further to be better the next time and keep lifting it up. And because a lot of people take no as it's like a personal thing. And then they go, you know, my wife's a dancer, she's a dancer. And she used to get cut. She'd go to a dance audition with 300 other girls and they would just cut them like, nope, 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 out. And she'd come home and she's like this. I go, aren't you bummed? She got, no. I wasn't right for the gig. I was just like, what? <laughs> I was right. like, I just never could see that. So I always say to young musicians, man, you're going to fit somewhere. It's going to be the right time and the right place. And if you believe in yourself, play your, play the music, find your niche and go in there and get it. And for me, it was rock and roll. I got in the right band at the right time and that, took me from the cult, the Guns N' Roses, the Velvet Revolver. And I say to people, my life has been based on probably the biggest of that band with Guns N' Roses. So take that, that opportunity when you get it. And then, you know, you're able to morph into other things because of that, that thing that you built. Right. But for young players, I just say, Work hard. Work ethic is there, man. It's not like you got to work hard at anything you do. And um, it didn't happen by accident. It, it was a lot of hard work. There was some luck involved. It was being in the midst of the energy that I talk, talked about earlier. I was in the, the pinnacle time of Hollywood for, you know, meeting other great musicians. And, you know, so yeah. keep doing what you're doing, man. And, and just go for it. You got nothing yeah. to lose. That's what I say. I agree with you. I mean, luck happens when you're, when you're ready, right? When you practice and you're ready, that's when luck happens, right? Cause that same opportunity presented itself and you hadn't done the homework. It really probably wouldn't present itself or wouldn't become something. So I think that that is really good advice to, to anyone pursuing anything. You know, get yourself yeah. ready for when opportunity does knock. And yeah. um, that's cool, man. Um, look, I, I, you know, had some tech issues, but, you know, I know you're on Palm Springs with your wife and, and living in the land of Sinatra. So I, I really do appreciate you being on the show. And I look forward to when this is all over and we're at the diner down the street from your house having breakfast one day <laughs> or, or uh, you know, just whatever, say hello. So good to see you. Well, I do appreciate yeah, it. You know, I appreciate you reaching out. You know, I know it's weird right now, especially in the bar world. You know, people aren't able to have this interaction. Right. You know, I, I remember when I first moved to England with the cult, 
when we were, you know, and I learned, I, I finally discovered pub life and I go, oh, I get it. I understand the community of pub life, the way we used to feel when we went to Jones's, you know, we were family. It was like, go in there and, you know, I go to a whiskey bar. I was like, that was my living room. The whiskey right. bar, you know, I'd go in there and drink with my buddies and meet all these cool, you know, and it's like that in any bar in the world. And God, we got to get back to that soon, man. Cause yeah, I can't wait. It's it's too much of uh, not having it. You really realize what you're missing when you don't have it. And for you not going on tour, you know, not playing live and for people not connecting as humans and, you know, and too much of that, I think, starts to unravel people. And I think we're at a point where we start, we need that connection soon. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks, man. Cool. All right. Enjoy it out there. Sister Frank. <laughs> Cheers to Frank. <laughs> Ring it ding ding. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Rock on the Rocks. Be well, be kind, rock on.